I absolutely believe in the kids that are coming out of our program. I really do believe that they're going to do great things. Welcome back, everybody. Rich Baker here with my friend Chris, mm -hmm. uh, another Midwesterner <laughs> relocated to Asia. A lot of insights about how to teach, work with Thais on a local basis to solve issues that they have. Some really interesting insights on how he tackles that, not from the Western in model, but really from the, the local out model. So Chris, do me a favor, uh, introduce yourself, the work you've been doing here in Bangkok for the last few years. Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Ostrike. I work at the School of Global Studies at Thomas Hout University. Uh, there I head up the uh, publications unit, so we're writing case studies around um, social innovation, social enterprise. Uh, they're contextually relevant for our students, so they're around uh, Asia Pacific. Um, I also do a fair amount of writing. Uh, I've got a, a small publishing firm, uh, Wicked Problems Collaborative. And then I, I'm also involved with the Circular Design Lab, okay. which is an, uh, a volunteer organization that I'm, I'm working with several of my colleagues. And what we're doing with that is trying to teach communities to use design with systems thinking embedded to try to solve big problems. What's your mission? You've got a lot of things going on. <laughs> In a, in a clean uh, yeah. sentence, what uh, is your vision? I guess I'm trying to do whatever I can to save the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's very specific. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly starting something new and, and trying to chip away at the different problems that I see. And I, I'm unfortunately not narrowly focused in what I see as the big problems in the world. And there's no one that to me is the thing that I have to absolutely work on. All, sure. the, all these different things is, is one thing that's all interconnected that we kind of have to fix them all. So what, what is it about being unable to focus that you think is unfortunate? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think if I focused on one thing, I'd, I'd get deeper and okay. maybe make more progress and that would feel good. Um, but I'm not capable of doing that. Unable as a human being no. to focus. That's a, a fair statement. What's the upside to doing that? I, I, I can, uh, I, can, I guess I can tell you a quick story that probably help with this. So I, I wrote a letter to our graduating students that just finished up a few weeks ago. In that letter, I, I told them the way I look at um, learning. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at learning as you know th th these the old art where people would put pins on a board and then they would stretch strings between them and they, they would make patterns. So I, I told the kids, I said, look, think of this, this artwork that you thought of. So if you start with just a few pins, the patterns that you can create are very limited. But when you start putting lots of pins on the board, the patterns you can create become very complex and interesting and, and you might find un, you know, things you might not have expected. So, so what I tell them to do is learn, go, when they get out of school, continue learning, learn something every day, and, and find things that you're interested in and dig in until it's not interesting anymore and then go find another one and do the same thing. And fill out your board with everything you can and then connect with people who have interesting boards as well. Yeah. And then you might be able to come up with wild, you know, really cool solutions that no one else would have thought of as an individual. And so as they're going through this process, like what are some of the key things that they should just be doing? Is this stuff that you should be learning, you know, behind a computer in your mm -hmm. job, or is it you're focusing to go outside and mm -hmm. experiment or, you know, yeah. inquire constantly? When I'm in the classroom, there's very little lecture. I might spend five or ten minutes at the beginning of a class explaining an idea to set the table. Mm -hmm. But then we typically are doing a case study or some kind of an exercise where hopefully they're building a mental model where the idea that if I had just asked them to repeat and then select the right answer on a, on a quiz, you know, they might have they might have remembered the words that went with that term. Right. But when but when we're doing it, the, they're learning how to apply it. We don't teach them things that they can get right or wrong. Yeah. But, but actually, I think it's really useful. How, how do they do with that? Because you know, Thai students, mm -hmm. Asian students, are more general. They're used to just being told mm -hmm. everything they need to know. Yeah. Their only job is to remember as much as they can and take an exam that mimics that. So. How do your students deal with that uncertainty, with that? I think it's a really shocking experience. It's like throwing them into a pool of ice water when, when they get to our program because most of them have been in that sort of experience up to the point of getting to us. Right. I get them in year three and I'm like, here's the problem, and they run away and, and work with it. I mean, I, I just, I had my last class with some graduating seniors a few weeks ago, and I went in there with, okay, this is the third week of a design uh, session. Now we're gonna, you know, patch up our ideas and present at the end of the session. I expected them to come in and kind of half-hearted and, you know, I, I, I had an intentionally light session. Right. They came in and blew me away with how hard they worked and the ideas they came up with because they really are passionate and they, and they really get into this stuff and they're excited to go out and, and start applying those ideas in their work. But I, I thought that millennials were lazy in the <laughs> 
and, and tied to their phone. Yeah. Um, so what are, what are you really seeing here? Like on a, you know, when, when you look out, mm -hmm. you look at your students. Yep. I mean, do you walk out like, oh my God, we're screwed? Or do you look out and like, wow, they're, they've got it. They're, they're gonna get it, no. we'll, we'll be okay. I absolutely believe in the kids that are coming out of our program. I really do believe that they're gonna do great things. And one of the, one of the things that I always talk to them about is uh, Danella Meadows leverage points, you know, the, the hierarchy. And, and that's very specific. And I, I kind of take it back a step and say, just, just look at this kind of metaphorically and, and think about where can you make change in the world? You know, what is the highest level? What is the biggest kind of change you can make? And work at that level. And then when the opportunity comes to work at a higher level, do that and right. and they all seem to have accepted that mindset and so they're all going out some are going to work in like design firms some are going to work in government agencies where they're they're leading innovation kids kids are going to do really cool stuff what are the issues that they are worried about personally that they talk to you about or that they t tend to clamor around when, they, when they're given the free time to work mm -hmm. on their own projects uh, i think Social issues are, are really common because they see them. I mean, they, they're, they're ever present uh, here. Um, but a lot of the kids are really, really big on environmental issues as well. So, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a nice mix. And w what I try to teach in, in my classes is, you know, if you care about social issues, you should care about environmental issues because every, every environmental issue becomes a social I issue eventually. Mm. And it's your job to convert them into social entrepreneurs right outside of school, to take the principles and embed them into big Thai companies. Like, what, what's your goal, and how, how are they? How do you think they're they're best placed when they graduate from the program? Um, I think our goal is to kind of turn them into Swiss Army knives. You know, they they get out of school and they can go wherever they feel comfortable and then make a difference. Some of our kids are going to want to go work in a big organization where they have lots of resources and training and, and opportunities. Some of them are going to want to go to like an NGO and have something really purpose oriented and they're going to feel you know, like they're, they're making a difference on the thing that really matters to them. Some of them are probably going to start their own organizations, if not right away, sometime in the next year or two. I think there are a handful of kids that are looking to go get some really good experience yeah. um, in, in a relevant space and then take that and go and launch their own things. What are the challenges or what are the friction points that you run into with the students as you're, as you're crafting them into this ultimate tool? One of the challenges for me is not going too deep too fast and losing people. Uh, just trying, you know, I, I've been there for three years now. When I, when I first got there, I think I went too deep too fast and, and students tended to tune out because they didn't know what I was talking about. Right. And so now I'm, you know, starting here and then slowly working my way down into the weeds and that seems to be working better. I try to take a lot of uh, take temperature as often as I can and make sure because that happens a lot when I do workshops because you have you have so little time right. and you want to get from here to here as fast as you can right. and so I tend to sprint there and then I and, you know people are like I'm lost so trying to make sure that you don't uh, leave people behind because then what's the so then what do you think are some general principles for how do you effectively teach these topics mm -hmm. you know on the surface level we're probably engaged yeah but you can lose very quickly like mm -hmm. what are three or four ways that you found it I have to do this to keep them, to really get them at the end of the shoot to be much better uh, tools or Swiss Army knives as it were. But, well, I, I think a lot of, um, there, there are two things that we do a lot of. One is case studies, mm -hmm. and those case studies are ones that we've gone out and learned about an organization and written the case study, and we, we do them in a way that it's, it's um, very small pieces. So you have one, half a page to two pages at most of reading, right. so they can be done in the classroom. I can hand the thing out, and then there are four or five discussion questions that go with that. The, these tend to be, they start with, here's the problem. Okay, th this is the problem that this community was dealing with. Without the, this is what they did. So you give them the, this is the mess. You give them enough of the circumstances to, to kind of understand what was going on and think about it and throw around ideas. And then they start with just, what, what might you do here? Mm -hmm. Then you say, okay, here's where they decided to go and here are the, the ne here's the next set of problems that they encountered. Yeah. And so e instead of giving them what the decision was, you stop them just short of the decision and say, here, here, here are some questions to think about. And they sit in, in groups and they have great discussions and they learn from each other. Uh, the other thing we do a lot of is things like uh, design workshops where we present them with a problem and some, some tools and, and ways to try to, to come up with ideas and put them together. And so they, they tend to go through that probably 
four or five work design workshops in, in our school. So when they graduate, I mean, human-centered design is, is something they're very comfortable with. So they, they can go somewhere and do that sort of stuff. So I think those, those um, experiences really help them gain confidence. Mm -hmm. And they can go, instead of saying, I know what human-centered design is, or I know what design is, I, I can do that. The challenges that you present mm -hmm. for the case studies, for the design workshops, do these tend to be the big challenges that we all face and they're gonna end the world? Mm -hmm. Or do they tend to be more local, strategic, you know, smaller things that they can actually tackle and understand better as a, as a starting point? There, there are local versions of big picture problems. Okay. Um, one of our case studies is on the Pizza Project in Malaysia, which is an organization that hires, well they can't hire, they work with refugee families. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a, a, a food service. So the refugee families will cook meals out of their kitchens. Um, the Pizza Project will do the sales, the logistics, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they contract, so they'll pay for the, they can pay directly the family to cook the meal, they can't hire them. Right. So that's that's been a, um, that's been a really successful project where they've helped a lot of families go from you know being basically destitute to being able to take care of themselves and improve their lives, keep their kids in school, that that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a project. I mean, it's a, it's about refugees, it's about employment, um, you know, those kind of social issues. Uh, but it's not solving it globally. It's looking at uh, contextually where what's what somebody's doing that's making a difference. You know, I've always struggled with this balance. Mm -hmm. Like, we got to get them to fix these big global problems, but mm -hmm. they only understand the the smaller, the, the more mm -hmm. personal stuff. Um, what's the balance that you try and strike? I, I try to teach the problems from a global perspective. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's kind of like I said earlier with working at, you know, the leverage points, working at the level that you can make a difference. Right. So you know, some of our kids are looking at possibly going into politics down the, the road and, and trying to change the laws so you can make big picture uh, changes within the country. Um, most of the kids, I think, at this point, in, in their life are probably geared towards working on local issues. Uh, but we talk a lot about regional and, and global perspectives on stuff. I mean, it's a school of global studies. We want them to think big picture. You know, how can you take something and, and maybe solve it locally, but then how can you turn that into something much, much bigger? And with, with, my, with my social enterprise, we're starting very small with a local project, try to figure out how to make that work in one place. And then the goal is to say, okay, now where else are people collecting these materials for subsistence? Can we, can we go there and then twist and turn this thing and make it work there? And, and then do that all throughout the region, maybe South America, maybe um, in Africa and Middle East, where, wherever, sure. wherever there's the, the, the circumstances give us the possibility, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll look at the possibility of finding partners and, and trying to uh, replicate. Now I've always said that being in Asia is like the best place in the world to be to mm -hmm. study, pilot, scale, mm -hmm. sustainability. Yep. Um, what are you seeing here? And like you mentioned, if we get it done here, we can take to other places. Mm -hmm. What is it about Bangkok that is such a great laboratory for you and for your students? Um, well, I mean, I, because I've lived here, I, I have developed a community. So there, there, we have a lot of resources to, to bring to bear through the universities, through corporate partners, uh, through the government, through um, civil society organizations. There are a lot of people working on the same stuff. They're either they're, they're doing academic studies, or they're piloting projects, or they're, they're fostering these kinds of things. So, I mean, me personally, just having built out that network here, uh, yeah. there's a lot of support that I can draw on, a lot of people that are trying to figure this stuff out. So, mm. that, that makes a big difference. What is it you hope you'll see in five to 10 years from now? I think you'll you'll see a generation that grew up with this, these problems starting to um, demand different things, and I think they'll they'll go into the workplace and do the kind of stuff that I was doing 10, 15 years ago with, with companies that weren't ready for it. You know, right. saying, look, we need to do this, and we can do this in a way that's good for the business. Uh, and I think people, they'll be going into government and, and changing things, and I think a lot of young people will be encouraging their parents. So I think I think the, the, the change, a lot of it's gonna be led by young people who look at the world differently than, than most of the people that are our age or older. And so the, what does that mean for today's social entrepreneurs? Then? Uh, I think now is now is a good time to solve these problems too, because if you if you I mean the, the problems are only going to get worse uh, until we figure out ways to deal with these things better. Um, I think there there are loads and loads of opportunities for social entrepreneurs. It's just a matter of taking ideas and, and putting them together in a way that you know that's sustainable from a business perspective. Right. Cool, man. Thank you very much. Yeah.